Welcome to the next episode of Great War Story. I've called this one, Tommy Come Lately, Why New Zealand's Troops Left Late in 1914, A Constitutional Crisis in the Colony. I rather like that name I came up with, Tommy Come Lately, because as you're probably aware, Tommy was a name assigned by the Germans to British troops. And the New Zealanders were also called Tommy by the Germans. And we're talking now about when the New Zealand troops were getting ready to leave New Zealand for the first time in 1914. And I found just today this movie clip of troops in Auckland parading very shortly before they're expected to leave. And you can see a lot of them march by and actually they're remarkably smart and they can all march in step, which actually, I have to say surprised me. And frankly, even if you just like cute dogs, it's worth watching. I don't know if you can make it out, but in the middle of the screen there, you can see there's a dog that's just running back and forth among the troops, just enjoying the day. And if you watch it through the whole way, you've, there's about two other dogs that are also joining in and marching along with the troops just for the heck of it. Now, if I was more technically savvy, I probably would have tried to insert some moving pictures, but also I didn't want to mess with the rights and all those issues of copyright. So I've given you the link there at the bottom of the screen and I'll try to put it in the uh, info at the end. But I do highly recommend that you watch the scene of the New Zealand troops just before they set off for war, or rather I should say, just before they thought they were going to set off for war. Now, to give you some background about what's happening, they all know they're gonna set off sometime soon. And I was fortunate enough to find this interesting collection of letters at the State Library of New South Wales website. Now, while he might've been an Australian, he was actually working as a crewman aboard the Monganui, the transport ship that would take my grandfather to war. And here are some pieces from his letters. 11th of September, 1914. Uh, I think I must be getting used to the wind and cold here. Don't notice it at all now. Well, Father, there's absolutely nothing to tell you. To go about the town, one wouldn't think there was anything unusual going on except that the crews of the transport boats take possession of the town at 10 o'clock each night. That's when the hotels close. It's very amusing to see half a dozen walking down the middle of the main street, singing at the top of their voices. No one interferes with them. They're all allowed to do just as they like. I've seen more drunken men here in the three weeks than I've ever seen. Don't think New Zealand will ever get over it, as they're all such holy joes. National prohibition will go flying through next election, I should say, after this. Now, to explain a bit of background for those not familiar with it, first off, you're already seeing the Australian-New Zealand rivalry, which was alive and well in 1914. Second, Wellington is called Windy Wellington. It's kind of famous for its cold and windy weather. And, um, and in New Zealand parlance, a hotel is a pub. So that's what's going on. The pubs close and then the drunken men are out on the streets. Then his next letter, 23rd of September. Well, we're off on Friday sometime. I've been loading horses for the last couple of days and are just about all on board now. There is to be a reception in the park tomorrow of the troops. Then they come straight on board. I think we'll go about midnight. I am jolly glad to be going. I'm sick of the sight of Wellington. There's absolutely nothing to see and nowhere to go. Sad to say, for poor old Clyde, G Clyde Giles, they weren't going to be leaving when he thought. And, uh, but they were certainly making a big hoo-ha getting ready for it. There's the New Zealand Prime Minister. And today, the Prime Minister said farewell to the Auckland section of the Expeditionary Force. Troops to the number of 2,200 marched to the Domain in Auckland, where a crowd of 14,000 collected. And here is the speech of the Prime Minister. New Zealand may only be a small country, but nevertheless it is not an unimportant part of the British Empire. In this crisis, 
New Zealand has made up its mind to do its duty to humanity by protecting the weaker nations of the world against tyranny. In a short time from now, they will leave our shores for the scenes of war, the very pick of our male population, who will proceed to the other side of the world to meet Britain's enemies in battle in countries where centuries ago the ancestors of New Zealanders held their own in many a fair struggle. You will find men there from sun-scorched India, from the plains of Canada, from the great Australian bush, from the wide spaces of South Africa. I hope that this cruel war will soon come to an end, but it must be peace with honour, or no peace at all. On behalf of the people of New Zealand, I wish you Godspeed. May God bless you. And then here we have Charles Cates, who I've quoted a number of times before in previous episodes. Well, we paraded about noon and marched to Newton Park, where along with the rest of the members of the expeditionary force, we were drawn up and inspected by the governor. Over 15,000 people were present, and the display of colour was a grand sight. After a march passed, we formed into column of route and proceeded to the wharf, out into the stream. Late that night, the order for our departure was cancelled. It appears that the lighthouse keeper observing a couple of warships off Cape Palliser, near the entrance to Wellington Harbour, signalled to them, but they refused to repeat a signal. On making closer inquiries, he discovered them to be a couple of German cruisers. The order was flashed over line to Wellington, thus preventing what might have been a national disaster. Now, this is what we call the fog of war, because it's complete garbage. There were no German cruisers anywhere near Wellington at the time, but that's what happens in war, isn't it? The rumours fly. Then we have George Bollinger, who I've also quoted before. We said goodbye to Wellington on Thursday. Our orders were suddenly cancelled. German Pacific Squadron is reported to have sailed through Cook Straits on Thursday night. Uh, Cook Strait, I should say, is um, the strait between the North Island and the South Island of New Zealand. It's just called the Cook Strait. It's not apostrophe S, but I've put it exactly as Bollinger himself put it. Tonight, we were told that we'd probably be here a few weeks. And then in Auckland, well, if anything, they had an even worse disappointment. Captain Colvin LG, who was sailing aboard the transport ship, the Waimana. Wednesday, 23rd September. Our send-off from Auckland was a very good one. Everything was business, and there was little time left for thoughts of what we're leaving behind us. We left the wharf about 6 p.m., just after our other troop ship, the Star of India, had to come to anchor, and so commenced our first night aboard. Thursday, 24th. Our long journey had commenced at last. The whole day has been somewhat rough, and most of us were in bed early. About 9pm we received a message to turn back with all speed to Auckland, and many were the conjectures as to the reason when we heard the news. There were naturally all kinds of rumours, but none of us could learn with certainty the real reason. Friday 25th. This morning early, we were back. Most of the men were unaware of our having turned, and could hardly believe their eyes when they recognised the landmarks. So far, we've not yet learned the real reason, but have now formed a good idea why we turned. And then there was Cecil Malthus aboard the Athenic, and we have a whole collection of his letters at the Hocken Library in Christchurch. And here's what he wrote. My dear Hazel, I suppose you know, you know from the papers that our departure has been postponed indefinitely. Goodness knows whether we will ever go now. Our fleet was under steam on Thursday morning when word came from the governor just in time to stop us. They say the Auckland forces had actually left harbour and were called back by wireless. We're going ashore tomorrow to camp. So what was going on? Why was the departure delayed? Well, published in the newspaper was the official New Zealand government explanation. His Excellency the Governor received advice from the Imperial Government on Friday morning that the New Zealand Expeditionary Force will not sail from the Dominion for some little time. The Governor is anxious, for obvious reasons, to take the people into his confidence on this matter at the earliest possible moment, but would earnestly request them not to make this a subject of comment 
as the delay is solely caused by the exig exigencies of the service when such extensive operations are everywhere in progress and applies as well to other expeditionary forces of the overseas dominions. The Prime Minister made a brief statement about the postponement when asked to do so by a reporter. There need be no uneasiness on the part of the public as far as our transports are concerned. The postponement of the date of sailing has been made under direct instructions from the imperial authorities. It is understood, says the Dominion, that the reason for the postponement had nothing to do with the safety or otherwise of our own seas, and that there is no reason to fear that they're any less safe than they have been since the outbreak of the war. Now, as you're probably aware, you don't necessarily trust government announcements as being entirely accurate. So I took the liberty of crossing out everything that we know to have been a lie from that official reasoning. And here we go. There it is. I fixed it. I have only left things in there that are objectively true and removed all deceit and outright falsehoods. Yeah. Not much left anymore, is there? So what was really going on? Well, I like this story because it involves so many moving pieces in so many parts of the world. We have a picture here from China, the port of Qingdao. And in the front, you can see a German cruiser, the Scharnhorst. And at the back, you can see a British cruiser, HMS Minotaur. And in those nice days before the outbreak of the war, they actually got on rather well together. They would have meals on each other's ships and knew each other quite well. But that was all to change, of course, once the war broke out. Now, I would like to talk very briefly about the pronunciation of this port name, because you're forever hearing it called Tsingtao by people, but that is not how it's pronounced. It is Qingdao. Now, most people actually may have encountered this name in modern times because the most common Chinese beer you will find in most Western countries is this one. And again, people insist on calling it Tsingtao beer because of the way it's spelled. But that is merely a different system of representing the Chinese characters that you see on the left, literally meaning well, greeny blue island. This word Qing is a little bit hard to translate because it kind of means a green or a blue or maybe a greeny blue color. But in any case, it is Qing Dao, not Sing Tao. That's the same for the bear. It's the same for the city. And the reason why bear is brewed there, in fact, is because it was basically a German colony. At the same time that Britain took a lease on the new territories in Hong Kong, the Germans took a lease on Qingdao. And, well, where the Germans go, they want their beer, and they founded a brewery in Qingdao in 1903. Now, as I had said a little earlier, everything changed as soon as the war broke out, and the British fleet in the east immediately started hunting the Germans. The problem was they had vanished. They left Qingdao as soon as the war broke out and nobody knew where they'd gone. They'd headed out into the ocean, but where exactly had they gone? The first sign was when they appeared in German Samoa. What you may not have been aware of is that Samoa at this time was a German colony. And so they were spotted in Samoa on September the 14th, which of course meant that was the way they were heading. A little bit later, they entered French territory a bit to the east in French Polynesia, and in fact sank a small French warship when they were there. So again, enabled you to reconstruct a little bit of where they were going. Now, not unreasonably, the New Zealand authorities were rather nervous that those German ships might choose to turn westward and head towards New Zealand, which would make the troop transports sitting ducks. Now, in the event that 
isn't what happened. And in fact, they were heading further to the east and they would soon after fight the Battle of Coronel and actually smash up some British warships. And later they would cross under South America and eventually get defeated um, around the Falkland Islands. They were making a run for home, but nobody knew that at the time. Now, lucky for us, at the UK National Archives, we can see a whole collection of the telegrams that were flying back and forth between London and New Zealand and Australia. And so if I was a bit more technically savvy, right now you would hear some noises in the background of, you know, telegram messages being sent and arriving and all those kind of things. So please just use your imagination. But here's a whole collection of what was going on, which may fill in some of the gaps about what was really happening. Telegram from the government of New Zealand to colonial office. Since German cruisers have appeared near Fiji and Samoa, Cabinet does not agree with Admiralty's views. Leader of the Upper House threatens to resign, which would place New Zealand in ferment. If Australian cruisers met expedition in Tasman Sea, it might help. In other words, we're nervous. We don't agree that it's safe for our boys to sail in the troop ships. Could you send some Australian cruisers across? Reply from the Colonial Office to the Governor of New Zealand. No further escort available. Your ministers had better postpone departure. Maybe delay of six weeks. Then the telegram from the Admiralty to the Commander-in-Chief, China. Singapore. Until Shan Horst and Guineas are now located, it is not considered advisable to transport the New Zealand and Australian troops under a convoy that cannot meet them. Minotaur and Ibuki are required to proceed past Fremantle, south of Australia, to Wellington. Now, the Minotaur was a heavy cruiser and the Ibuki was a Japanese heavy cruiser. And what they're saying in context of cannot meet them, in other words, cannot meet them in battle. Telegram from Commonwealth Naval Board to Admiralty. Is it safe to begin moving transports from eastern ports to Albany without escorts? Telegram from Secretary of State for the Colonies to the Governor of New Zealand. Was Officer sure it was Shan Horst and Geniza now that he saw off Samoa? Telegram from Senior Naval Officer in New Zealand to Admiralty. Departure of New Zealand expeditionary force delayed on account of telegram from Governor General of Australia saying Tasman Sea is not safe. Telegram from Governor of New Zealand to Secretary of State for the Colonies. Expedition will leave 25th of September as originally arranged. Should reach Fremantle 7th of October. Cabinet trouble due to conflicting reports as to position of German warships. Telegram from Governor of New Zealand to Secretary of State for the Colonies, 24th September. Governor General of Australia tells me grave risk if expedition sails tomorrow, have countermanded sailing. Now, at the British authorities in London were not impressed by this. Telegram from Secretary of State for the Colonies to the Governor of New Zealand and the Governor General of Australia. Admiralty adhere to view that dispatch of Australian and New Zealand troops to point of concentration at Fremantle is free from undue risk. However, in view of your anxiety, Minotaur and Ibuki will go to Wellington to pick up New Zealand transports and bring the whole along. This will cause three weeks delay. Message to New Zealand. Australia has been told they'll have to wait for you. Message to Australia. What do you mean by telling New Zealand there was a grave risk? You must not communicate with New Zealand without my assent. Um, it's pretty easy to see the outrage and the anger dripping off the words of this telegram. Now, after World War I was over and after Prime Minister Massey had passed away, a member of the New Zealand Parliament came out with more details about what had been going on. And there had been a major argument between the governor of New Zealand and the prime minister. These days we'd call him a governor general, but at this time his official title was governor. And he had this improbable name of Arthur William de Brito Seville Foljambi, the second Earl of Liverpool. 
And Lord Liverpool said, ah, the light cruises in New Zealand waters, HMS Psyche, HMS Philomel, and HMS Pyramus are more than sufficient protection. Uh, the truth be told, they would have been absolutely smashed up if they'd come up against this, the Shan Horst or one of these German heavy cruisers. They would have stood no chance at all. And that is exactly what Prime Minister Massey said. Absolutely not. And he carried on. Mr. Massey, with his customary candor and firmness, asserted that if his lordship persisted in the course he had indicated, he would have to find another prime minister to give effect to the desire of the British Admiralty. In other words, the governor said, I say the troops sail. The New Zealand prime minister said, well, I say they don't. The governor said, well, I represent the king. I am in charge of New Zealand forces. It's my decision. Mr. Massey said, if that's your answer, then myself and the entire New Zealand cabinet will resign in protest. Well, you can imagine how that would have looked at the start of World War I to have an, an entire colonial government resign in protest against Britain's handling of the war effort. So not surprisingly, the governor was forced to back down and narrowly averted a major constitutional crisis. Now, I want to take a brief digression here because it's always been my dream that maybe one day, you know, my grandfather's story could be turned into a TV series. And so I sometimes kind of think of scripts and the way it goes. And when you're telling a story, you always want to bring in a few more female characters or maybe a love story or something like that because when you've got an exclusively male dominated story like you know something a story of world war one for example um it gets a little bit less interesting you want a bit more color and a bit more variety in it and we've seen this in plenty of other contexts so an example of this would be a movie made in new zealand the lord of the rings now in the movie that everybody's familiar with, there is the confrontation with the Black Riders who are after Frodo, and the female elf Arwen carries Frodo on her horse and confronts the Black Riders at the ford of Brunin. But actually, that was an invention that wasn't in the book. It wasn't Arwen at all. It was a male elf, Glorfindel, that got him there. And in fact, he wasn't even there. It was Frodo on his own who crossed on a horse. But fair enough, it worked very well in the movie. And I like the way they exaggerated the part of Arwen and gave her a much bigger role in the movie. And, you know, I can see the reason for it. So if we were going to tell the story of my grandfather and the delay of the fleet, wouldn't it be nice if we had a love story or something like this that we could include? And luckily enough, we do. Now, this is from a newspaper story explaining exactly what happened. A wedding ceremony and unique surroundings took place in Wellington on Sunday afternoon when Sergeant Arthur Field was married to Miss Elsie Webb. The place was on troopship number three, lying at the King's Wharf. Number three is the Monganui, my grandfather's transport. The bridegroom is a British reservist and he has been living in New Zealand for some time. Arrangements had been made for his fiancée to come out to New Zealand, where the wedding was to take place, and she left England before the war broke out. She arrived by the Ruahini to learn that a prospective husband had been called to the colours and was on the point of leaving for England. Nothing daunted, the couple decided to go on with the arrangement, and yesterday afternoon, Chaplain, the Reverend J. A. Luxford, performed the marriage ceremony. At the conclusion, the sergeants and soldiers on the boat wished their comrade every happiness, and the bride and groom walked under an arch of crossed bayonets, as is the custom on such occasions. Oops, sorry. So, we have a beautiful story. They almost had the tragedy that she was sailing out from England and he would have got on a troop ship and been going in the opposite directions and they would have missed each other. But because of the delay, because of the German East Asia squadron 
Elsie had just enough time to make it to New Zealand and just enough time to find her man and get married aboard the troop ship. Now, this next slide is just to tell you where I got this particular story from. I didn't find this with my own research. I follow a Facebook page called Random Snippets of History, Manawatu and Beyond, and I want to acknowledge that that's where I got it. If you like sort of random local history stories, even for a region of New Zealand that may not be related to you, I highly recommend it. There's often a lot of quirky little posts there and quite interesting little things, and I thoroughly enjoy it. Now, I wanted to check this story and see what I could find. So I managed to find Sergeant Arthur Field's military file. It actually took quite a while because I didn't know his service number. And you can imagine that Field is a pretty common last name. And sadly, often the service files and the New Zealand government ar archives doesn't let you specify the first name. Often they'll only have an initial. So I had to go through an awful lot of files of men with the last name Field and the first initial A, but I found him in the end. And he was, in fact, in the ASC attached to the Mounted Field Ambulance. In other words, he was exactly in the same unit as my grandfather doing the same job. He was a sergeant while my grandfather was just a driver, but they were both Army Service Corps men attached to look after the horses in the Mounted Field Ambulance unit. And there are particulars of his next of kin. And what do we see? Elsie Webb, who was from England. That was his spouse. That matches the story. And when did they get married? They got married on October the 11th, 1914, on board His Majesty's New Zealand Transport Number no. 3, the Monganui at Wellington. And the question, everybody would naturally want to ask now they've just got married at the very beginning of world war one did arthur make it home or did he die in the war leaving elsie a widow and pleasant to say he did make it home but she had to wait for a long time it was the 7th of february 1919 when arthur finally embarked from england to head back to New Zealand aboard a ship called the Ajana. And eventually Arthur Field would die in October 1963. And that Facebook group I was just talking about was wondering if they ever had any children because there's nothing in the military file to indicate if they had kids or not. But as I was looking around, I actually managed to find a note of a New Zealand soldier who fought in World War II called Albert Edward Field. He was part of the second NZEF, New Zealand Expeditionary Force. These are the ones who went out in World War II. And his address in Wellington at 7 Shortland Street, Kandala, was the same address I found associated with Elsie Webb. So while I can't prove it definitively, I'm pretty confident that Albert was the son of Elsie and Arthur. So yes, they did have children. And one more detail. We have the name of the minister who married them, Luxford. We've heard about him before. He was the one who conducted the funeral for Captain Bell in Egypt. Now, I want you to also note briefly the rank that they give him on this particular document. They call him a major. That's not quite true, and I'll explain that in a moment. Now, there's another photo of him, and his full name and title is Chaplain John Eldred Luxford. And when I looked up his military file, I was initially very excited because most of these military files might be 10 pages long, sometimes 12 or 15. So when I opened this one up and saw that it was 270 pages long, I was very excited indeed because unusual files are interesting. They usually have fascinating stories. Unfortunately, in this case, it absolutely wasn't true. And I read through it all, so you don't have to do not bother looking up his file you will see endless letters about his prostate cancer treatment bill uh, when he was discharged from the army he got this radiotherapy for prostate cancer which killed him soon enough and then the army argued back and forth amongst themselves 
constant letters over who should pay the bill because getting cancer technically wasn't an injury that you acquired during your military service. So they eventually ruled that it wasn't something that they should really pay for. But in the end, somebody else countermanded that and said, well, yes, technically we shouldn't pay for it, but I think we'll pay for it just out of generosity and kindness, just this one time, because, well, that's what I say. And then, oh, goodness me, there were pages and pages of letters back and forth because he wanted to be called a chaplain major. And somehow or rather, the New Zealand army had decided that chaplains wouldn't be given military ranks. They would just be called chaplain. And they said, this is perfectly honorable and perfectly fine. And then Luxford kept writing letters to complain about it. And they kept writing letters back saying no. And that was long and boring and terribly unexciting. And then there was all sorts of complaints about how hard it was for Methodists become, to become army chaplains because that usually went to Church of England guys and so on and so on. And then there was some also some stuff where he was complaining about wet canteens at army bases because letting the men get access to liquor encouraged immoral behavior and also a whole bunch of stuff where he was complaining about issuing prophylactics to the troops during World War I and how this also encouraged immoral behavior. If you don't know what prophylactics are in this context, look it up yourself. Now, Let's get back to the bigger picture. I want to pose a what if to you. What if New Zealand troops had left on time, September the 24th, when they were going to leave, instead of October the 16th, when they did eventually leave? Well, as was already noted in one of the documents I cited earlier, when they first left, they were not heading for Egypt. They were heading for England. And their departure had been delayed by exactly 22 days. Now they were going to be going to camps at Salisbury Plain. And what I've put there in the background is actually a photo of what Salisbury, Salisbury Plain in England was actually like at the time. It was one of the wettest, worst winters that Europe had suffered in years. Now, the Ottoman Empire had not even declared war on the side of the Germans when the New Zealanders left their shores. In fact, they had time to get to Albany and cross into the Indian Ocean with all the Australians, and they were halfway up to Sri Lanka, Ceylon as it was called at the time, before they even knew that the Turks were enemies. Now, there was a second factor going along. The Australians sent a colonel to inspect the camp at Salisbury Plain, and he was absolutely horrified by the conditions and said this was absolutely not ready for the troops, and he suggested that the men should be left off in Egypt where they could undergo further training. Now, eventually, Lord Kitchener was persuaded that maybe this was a good idea, and so on November the 24th, he agreed that they would get off in Egypt. So an order was sent out, it wasn't sent out, well, I should say it didn't arrive to the troop ships until late night, November the 28th, and they were already in the Suez Canal by this point. And so they got into the Mediterranean, went straight to Alexandria, and disembarked in Egypt, and depending on which troop ship it was, it was somewhere between December the 1st or December the 3rd when they disembarked in Egypt. Now, what if they had actually departed on September the 24th? According to my calculations, they would have arrived in England by about November the 11th. The way I judged this was by looking up one of the ships that was with the fleet at the time, the Arawa, on another voyage. When the Arawa left England in 1919 to travel back to New Zealand, carrying some of the men home, she took 45 days. So if they left on September the 24th, they would have arrived in England before the Ottomans had even entered the war. They never would have got off in Egypt. So what 
would have changed if they hadn't got off in Egypt? Well, because they were in Egypt, there were an extra 30,000 British troops available for use in fighting in the Middle East. And I can't help thinking that that influenced the decision to undertake the attack on the Dardanelles and launch the whole Gallipoli campaign. If they hadn't had those 30,000 men sitting in Egypt, would they have gone ahead with the attack at all? And even if they had made the decision to go ahead with the attack with other units, well, the Australian and New Zealand troops wouldn't have been there. And that would have meant a significant change in the history of Australia and New Zealand. In a past episode, I talked about what a big deal April the 25th is in both Australia and New Zealand. It's Anzac Day. It's the anniversary of the landings at Gallipoli. The whole Anzac legend would never have happened, at least not in the form as we know it. Um, the picture there comes from this illustrated history, great book that I acquired a few years ago by Dave Dye. And if they had been present in England at that point, no doubt they would have been deployed much sooner than they otherwise were to the fighting in France. And so I looked up to see what battle would probably have been their first major engagement. And the Battle of New Chapelle in March 1915 was a pretty good candidate. And in fact, there were a lot of colonial troops engaged in that battle. In this case, it was Indian troops. So I think in an alternate world where the troops left on time and were not delayed till October, they would have traveled to England and then they would have been deployed to France. And March 1915 would have been their first major battle on the Western Front. Would it have changed that much in terms of how many died? Well, probably not, because Gallipoli was brutal and bloody, but so was the fighting in France. But it certainly would have been a different world, and we wouldn't have had Anzac Day and the Anzac legend as we now recognize it.